All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for the for the break there, folks. Um, all right, uh, don't be shy on the chat or the other, um, uh, you know, you're stepping up with questions if you have it. Um, you know, again, in, a, in the, in the when we normally do this, we, we get a chance to get to know each other and be around and have lots of meals and that such sort of thing. And so a lot of that gets lost in uh, this format, unfortunately. And so I, you know, hopefully you'll take a moment and, you know, introduce yourself at random, like just pick somebody off the chat list and introduce yourself to them and say hi on a private chat and get to know somebody here. Um, it would be great if we could get some kind of connections generated out of a out of this virtual, um, uh, you know, anomic abyss we live in for the moment. Um, so uh, that was a, a quick hit on the modeling part. Uh, David Hunter, just to give you a preview, he'll be speaking tomorrow on a new version of Ergum's, um, uh, well, not a new version of Ergum's, but a new element in Ergum uh, that is, uh, has always been there, but it's been hard to use, which is on bipartite Ergum. So we talked at the very beginning of today about these um, models, this way of thinking about networks of persons to groups. Um, and so oftentimes the traditional way of analyzing those networks um, uh, in sociology has been to, um, it's called project them. So you look at the people connected through groups, but you could just model the exact object of people's ties to groups and groups members and um, directly um, in the same way that I just described now, it's just that the row and column effects end up taking um, very different characters depending on if the row is a person or a group, for example, on the column. And so it's a nice way to, to think about some of those things. But anyway, it's, he's going to talk about that in uh, he and uh, his collaborator, Cassie, if I remember right. Um, right? No. Uh, I'll, I'll look at it again. Anyway, back in. All right. What I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about simulation modeling. Um, simulation modeling is a uh, a pretty standard way of dealing with things in social networks and health. And uh, those of you who had a chance to um, see the, the full presentation, the, the re there are lots of reasons why we simulate data. And um, if you think about it for a minute, what a simulation is, like we're just gonna make some shit up, right? So we're gonna make up our data, which on the one hand seems like a crazy thing to do. Why would you do that? Um, I, if, you, if you care about a question, go collect data on it. But it ends up, of course, being the case that um, that's just not feasible most of the time or much of the time. And so um, oftentimes you want to simulate data in order to do a better job of trying to explain the world um, uh, than your data you have at hand can do. Um, broadly, so I give a, here a, a set of ways of thinking of this, but broadly, um, well, we tend to do it either because the data we have at hand um, is incomplete uh, either because there's some operation on the data we'd like to do that we couldn't do otherwise, like see the disease and see where it goes, right? You can't do that for ethical reasons. Um, and you certainly don't have the data to do it in hand. Um, or because you just can't collect data on the whole thing. So if I want to know how a disease is going to spread through a city, I'm rarely going to have individual data on each person in an entire city to know where they go and who they bump into. So being able to figure that out is just incomplete data. And so there's a bunch of reasons why we can't do an analysis on observed data that has to do with the incompleteness of our data, either because of ethical or data collection issues. Um, and then there's another type of a way of thinking about why we simulate, which is because we're interested in a theoretical question and we want a way to um, take a really complex theory and see how the elements of those theories interact to create some emergent property that we might not otherwise have. Um, and so, uh, I like to think about this in this simple kind of you know, two-dimensional space, which is that you can think about simulations as being theory-based versus data-based. And so a theory-based simulation is one in which I might understand a social process, like a peer influence process. Um, and a data-based one is where I've observed some set of data that I want to fit my model to, to some degree. And so I wanna, you can often interpolate between them. And we have a lot of really simple models that are down here at the theory-based end that have that are deliberately turned into toys. That is, the idea with a with a pure theory-based model is that I really want to understand some very narrow theoretical element, and I don't care so much like how it might play out in the real world exactly. I'm not trying to predict what's going to happen tomorrow with the model. Instead, I want to know if I, if I turn the lever implied by the theory, 
what happens to the system. And this is often really important for questions um, in social networks because a lot of times the social network features that we think about create processes that, we, that are hard to intuit. And so our intuition, at least for most of us, um, our intuition about the way these complex data structures work, um, uh, these things we call networks work as a function of individual behavior is pretty poor. And a classic example are the ways in which you might see the rise of a giant connected component as a function of a person's degree. You wouldn't, most of us wouldn't intuit a sharp line. We would expect that the, the, the size of the connected component would increase linearly with the number of nodes in the net, or the number of edges in the network. And it turns out it doesn't at all. It has this really funky shape where it's nothing, 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 and then everything. And so those kinds of elements in a network like we never see a network that's purely random, but understanding that on a purely random graph um, build helps us build intuition that wouldn't otherwise be there. And so that's what I mean by theory-based versus database. And then this illustration versus toy, this illustration toy versus realism prediction model idea is that sometimes we are generating these models because what we want to do is just play with an idea on the real world. And we might actually take real world data and apply a really simple simulation model. And so it's an illustration in that sense. We don't, we're not trying to predict who's going to vote a certain way. On the other end, we might be really interested because we're policymakers in why you know, one neighborhood is going to get diseases more often than another neighborhood. So what is it about being in this neighborhood? Or, or I want to allocate resources for vaccines or something. I want to know where the risk is really happening. And, um, simulation models run the gamut of this entire space, right? So the classic shelling segregation model is a model where space has been abstracted entirely. It's, a, it's supposed to be a model of where people live and racial segregation and housing, um, but it is not on a physical map. It's on an end by end grid and each person can move randomly wherever they want. So there's hardly any realism at all to that model, but it tells us something intuitive and it's something that ends up being interesting which is that segregation in the housing market can emerge with even if the market is perfectly fair and everything else, so long as people have just a slight preference for their neighbors being like themselves, you get overwhelming segregation in the model because of a spillover effect. And so that kind of intuition comes out of the model, even though it's completely divorced from reality. On the flip side, to so the far extreme of that, would be something like, uh, there's a famous model called CoreSim, um, uh, which was developed in the late 80s and early 90s, the first iteration, I think, is, I think they're up to CoreSim 4, CoreSim 5 now, um, which was developed to support the Social Security Administration to figure out how many old people would need Social Security um, uh, in 10 years from the date of the model. And the argument was that simple linear regression projection models um, were insufficient to capture the kind of feedback processes of kids having kids and caring for their folks and quitting retiring and so forth that are built into real world behavior. And so if we had a really tight prediction model um, uh, based on a series of linked equations grounded in real data that we would align with the last 20 years, we could predict the next 10 years. And so these kinds of models, these really, really detailed data prediction models are focused on um, really on prediction and not on understanding. And so the CoreSim model includes dental records. I mean, not because they care about dental records, but it turns out that it helps the prediction of who's gonna need disability um, uh, funding later. And so these kinds of things can get really, really down in the weeds and they're not meant to generate understanding, they're meant to generate prediction. So that's just the field that there. I set the talk up, the wider talk up around um, three kinds of things that happen in any simulation. So any simulation has an environment, it has agents, and it has rules. And the environment is the setting within which agents act, which includes other agents. And it's where agents draw the input um, and where they usually put their output. Um, and it can range from everything from an actual map, so of a neighborhood block group, if you're doing a disease simulation in a city, to an abstraction, which would be like an end by end grid or a random graph or something like that. Your agents are usually the thing that are, agents are your actors in the model. Um, they usually, for sociologists and social behavior and health folks, represent people, but they need not. They can be animals, they can be um, buildings, they can be whatever you think they might be on whatever is relevant for the action in your theory, those are your agents. And your agents need not be of one type. You can have you know, people and animals in the same simulation, for example, if you're looking at parasite transfer or something. 
Um, the thing about agents is that agents do stuff. And when I say agents do stuff in silico, what it means is they take something out of their environment, they process it, and they put something back in their environment. What they take from the environment and what they put in the environment becomes an input and an output for the next agent. So agents are interdependent in this sense. And that's when it's most interesting. It is possible to write an agent-based model where I pull from the environment, do something with it, put something out from the environment, and it has no effect on any other agent in the model. Um, if you do that, you should just do a linear regression because you have a, you have, there's no point in doing all the setup work that comes from it. And so when agent-based models are interesting is when there's some feedback process where the output from one agent becomes the input for the next agent and vice versa and usually reciprocal. And so those kinds of feedback loops that happen in a simulation process get captured in ways that are just really difficult to capture in any other kind of generalized model. So if you have an environment and you have agents, then they're doing stuff, well, what are they doing? Well, what they're doing is based on the rules you write. And there are two kinds of rules you typically write for a simulation. There are agent rules, that is the things the agents do with their inputs that generate a new output. And so um, uh, for the, you know, it could be as simple as I look around, that's the input. I see whether or not the number of neighbors that are like me are above my threshold. If they're not, I move to somewhere else, right? So that would be a very simple rule for a shelling segregation model. Um, Agent-based rules could be everything from, uh, you know, something really simple like that to really detailed things about, um, uh, about how they re react to a particular kind of input um, uh, that they get from their neighbors. So it could be, if you're trying to simulate family dynamics, it might be that you know a kid cries under a certain situation and yells under another situation, and you have a really detailed set of rules about when kids yell versus get angry versus get sad, and that model then um, uh, changes the way in which parents react to the things the kids do. So you could you can write these things as detailed as you want. A second class of rules um, people often forget about, but end up you, you're going to spend a lot of time writing them if you write these models are global processing rules. And so global processing rules govern how the simulation as a whole runs. And um, it has to do with how you generate iterations, whether or not actors act simultaneously, whether they act in sequence, whether you randomize the action or you prioritize it based on some discomfort that um, the environment creates for your agents. Right? There's lots of things that can go into these processing rules. And the point is that you want to treat them on the same plane as your agent rules because they sometimes don't matter, but they often do. And so you want to make sure that you're, you're um, uh, actively thinking about them as opposed to just doing what seems sensible as a first pass. Okay. So I broke up the way we think about simulations for social networks health into simulations of networks, simulations on networks, and both simulations of and on networks. Um, uh, I'm just giving you an example here of arguably the, the, and I go through the presentation, a whole bunch of different ones. And if you're interested in those details, I'm happy to talk about them. But the um, classic simulation for social networks and health is a diffusion simulation. And so a diffusion simulation for a disease um, uh, tries to replicate a susceptible infective or susceptible infective recovered kind of situation. And the basic rubric looks something like this, right? For some given network structure, you seed the network with a, an initial thing that's going to get diffused, be it a belief or a disease. And for as long as there are discordant pairs, that as long as some people have the belief and other people don't, then you do the next thing, right? Um, uh, you, you have some transmission rule. And then once everyone's re and infected, you have some kind of recovery rule. And then you just iterate this thing over and over again until you get to some stopping point you want. And I just wanted to use this as a way to illustrate like these four elements, right? So you have the environment is the population of actors linked by network ties. The agents are represented by people who could be infected. The agent rule, if it's a disease of the simulation is whatever biology governs recovery and whatever biology governs transmission. And the general processes rule are probably serial spread. That is that um, you, it's the case that I spread and then you get it, right? And so that's the way you might think about it. Um, Simulations on networks, you can think about that gen and generating diffusion across lots of things. That's what this is an example of. Um, note that um, the beauty about simulation on networks is that you don't have to simulate a single thing on a network. You can simulate competing things. So it might be that I'm simulating flu and I'm simulating protective behavior against getting the flu simultaneously. 
And what you want to see is whether or not one beats the other out or under what conditions one beats the other out so that you could um, help generate better policies for promoting um, uh, flu prevention. Um, and in this case, this is a really fun simulation because the uh, contact network is actually spatially governed. Um, uh, so people bump into people next to them and that's how they spread the flu. Um, and they also see people who are engaged in protective activities like mask wearing or taking Tamiflu or these kinds of things. Um, we've done a lot of these simulations where you do both um, uh, generate the network and generate um, a process on the network. Um, in this case, it was an attempt to ask, answer a very detailed realistic question using real data, but we didn't have complete network data. So we wanted to know, is it possible for a heterosexual um, uh, outbreak of HIV in Shanghai um, to get you know, at, at to a worrisome size, um, but we did, there's no way we could collect network data on all of Shanghai, right? So instead what we had um, uh, was an ego network sample of people um, in each of these settings and a separate sample of commercial sex workers. And that gave us enough information to talk about, to, to simulate networks based on the mixing matrices, which as you see here, and based on the degree distributions segregated by age, that allowed us to then simulate from this a, um, a network of people who are connected. Um, and it turns out in this network that commercial sex workers are incredibly important. That's where the volume came from to create enough connectivity to even get a large connected component. But the connected component never made up more than 15 or 16% of the population. And if you then ran a disease simulation, a biologically informed disease simulation over that network, you never got chains long enough, uh, transmission chains long enough to infect hardly anyone at all. And so um, the risk of a heterosexual um, uh, a disease transmission, even given, and this was the concern of the, of the, at the time, given the, the fairly brazen levels of um, commercial sex work in the, in the context um, uh, was not sufficient to create much risk for an outbreak. And that's just an example of the way these things work. Um, there's a bunch of implementation things I can go through that I'm happy to do if people are interested. Um, I think that the main thing is, is if you wanna start this work, you can sort of start with this work light or you can start with this work heavy. If you're not already deeply embedded in an agent program that's the best for you to start with, I encourage you to go play with NetLogo. Um, NetLogo is an agent-based modeling simulation program. That's what it's meant to do. The beauty of NetLogo um, uh, is that it's written by Yuri Lewinsky, um, uh, who is really good at it. <laughs> and so he's, he's written a program that he's spent the last 20 years writing. Um, and what's great about it is there are now hundreds of sample models that are shared that you can then expand from. So if you want to start with the shelling segregation model, which is a two race model on an N by N grid, and layer that for six races over a real um, thing with constraints on price, you could do that. Um, and you could do it by building on the models that are already there. The language under the hood is also really simple. It's a very sort of clear, um, easy to understand language. It's an object oriented language built to have these kinds of recursive feedback processes. So it's also really fast. The main problem with NetLogo is that it's kind of, if you have a database simulation with, and you have really complex rule sets for different kinds of agents, it's a little hard to coerce NetLogo into using that. It can be done, and he has a whole course, um, uh, an online textbook to, that lets you see how to do those kinds of things, but it's not intuitive, and so it takes a fair amount of work to get there. Um, most of us instead generate networks in programs that we're happy to work with, um, and the main, the main thing about generating simulations in programs you already know how to use is to make sure you really do know how to use them so that you don't do things that make sense when you do data analysis that don't make sense when you do simulation. And the classic thing to do here is for, and uh, uh, Nico will put these slides together for us, um, uh, is to think about the ways in which um, uh, you might build a loop. So a lot of things that you do in a simulation implicitly are iterations, like time goes through an iteration for each time step something happens. And so you might think you want to write your simulation to start at time one and then loop over till time whatever, um, say for five years or 10 years or whatever you think a loop means. Um, and the problem, of course, is that R sucks at doing loops. It's really slow. And so what you're better off doing is instead of writing a loop from one to 50 is to create a 50 element vector that you then do the operation on that vector. And so the little tricks like that you'll end up um, uh, coming away with 
as you um, start to understand your model. Another example is um, you might think that you were, if you have a population that changes, people are born and people are die, that at the, at the end of each iteration, you have to then add the newborn people into your data set and pull the dead people out. Well, that's gonna require you to re-merge and re-change your data set over and over again. You're actually much more efficient to first generate a data structure that's bigger than you're ever gonna need and only change the elements of the data structure that are relevant to your model as opposed to going through the overhead of moving the pieces of, of the data set around. Um, there are some more examples um, uh, in this set. The other little bit of advice I would give just quite quickly um, uh, before I, I stop here um, uh, is to say that um, build your models patiently and slowly. And it's kind of like that, um, the old joke from those of you that watch Disney cartoons is that you build your, your simulations are like onions, right? They have these layers. And you want to build those layers from the inside out. So you want to make sure that your primitives, the things that are at the base element of your model work right. And you should be able to write those things and check those things very carefully with known results. Because what's interesting is how those known things come together in unknown ways and produce emergent properties that you don't expect. Um, and in order to get to that point, you need to make sure you don't have a bug way down deep in the code. Because what happens when you're writing simulations is you're implicitly becoming a software engineer. And I don't know about you all, but most of us are not trained to be software engineers. We're trained to be data analysts and scientists. And so you wanna like be really humble as you go in to write these things and not do the kinds of things that um, are gonna lead to mistakes later on. Um, and there are, I, I add some horror story things that are from my own experience. You wanna make sure you don't do, right? So make sure your model has some kind of an output this is my first quick hit, like some kind of an output to a log or some other monitoring to let you know that it's still running and that it hasn't sort of stopped. Also find some way to make sure that you don't lock yourself into an infinite loop. Um, it's remarkably easy to write simulations that, end, that result in infinite loops if the stopping criteria for your simulation is something that the simulation generates. Right? It's not just an explicit count over time. If you wanna say run your model until a certain number of people are infected, but then you write the model in such a way that not that many people could get infected, then it'll just keep running. And so you have to watch out for those kinds of things. All right, I'm gonna stop there and um, see if we have questions. Hopefully people had a chance to, to, to see where we're at. Uh, any questions or thoughts that came up in the chat or thoughts on these kind of models in general? There's a, a question in the chat right now. Um, okay. I can summarize it or it's, how does a simulation technique, which you described compare with multiple imputation, um, like multiple imputation with chained equations in cases where network data are missing? Can multiple imputation be used for network data? What are other approaches to best address missing network data? That's a great question. We're going to have a session on missing data um, tomorrow at 12.45, um, uh, based on some work that Jeff um, uh, Smith, John Morgan, and myself have done. So that we'll answer that question in directly later. Uh, most of these simulations differ from, the, 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 the quick answer is that they differ from imputation models in that the goal is not to build a substrate that is based just on um, the covariant structure of your data but instead to have a feedback process with rules. Now, the way they are the same is that when you take a set of ego networks, for example, and then simulate from that a global network, the rule really is um, essentially repeat the pattern you've observed in your sample. And so in that sense, it is just like multiple imputation and it's the analysis part is very similar. And so for example, in the Shanghai example, what we did is we simulate the network or impute the network from the observed data. Um, it, 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 the reason I, I'm a little bit leery to use the word impute is that we've imputed so much wider than the world we have in front of us, right? So we've, we've actually um, not just taking relations that are missing amongst the data we have, we've instead created a whole new class of nodes that we never, we never sampled. And so, but in that sense, you're exactly right. We then create one instance of that, run a simulation over, re-simulate a, um, a, a version of the data and do it again. The main difference with, with classic multiple imputation 
is classical multiple imputation, you do a very small number of replicates. And so you'll do four or five um, uh, replicates of your, you know, your standard multidimensional database and then run a regression five or six times and then um, uh, in, you know, average those coefficients because they're all gonna be pretty close to each other. And that's because from a standard missing data standpoint, you're missing you know, single digit percentiles of your sets. For network data, when I'm, when I'm starting with a, a sample of you know, 500 commercial sex workers and then generating a network with 5,000 commercial sex workers, it's a very different um, order of magnitude issue. And the ways in which these things could differ um, is really dramatic. So you wanna do a lot more iterations. And so in the, in the trying to, I think we ended up generating something like a thousand different versions of our network and then ran the simulation like a thousand times over it. Now, it might be a bit exaggerated because it's been many years since I've gone back and looked at that, but it's that kind of an order of difference as opposed to doing two or three different imputations. You typically generate thousands of draws from your distribution and then run your process many, many times over each of those distributions. Um, uh, does that help answer the question? And again, like I said, we'll do missing data specifically um, uh, tomorrow. Good, good, thank you. Any other substantive questions or thoughts on when you might use simulations? I I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I love doing simulations for social network analysis because it's the kind of thing that really lets you get at a social process. If I wanna understand diffusion and I wanna know why it is that um, one, like why is it that African-Americans get um, uh, COVID more often than whites? Um, and so the question could be about where they live, about who they interact with, about how they engage with the health service. Well, I can simulate that in ways that are really difficult to get data on, particularly in real time. Um, if I want to know whether or not I'd be better off, you know, closing the border versus closing certain airports, simulations are great places to put that. Um, and it really does provide a nice, fun way to help think about things um, in ways that you can't do um, with real data. Any other questions or thoughts on this? All right, so um, at 2.40, we're supposed to pop in um, with Tyler McCormick. Um, Tyler, have you popped in yet? I can't see my list of people because I'm sharing my screen. 